Welcome to the Sandbox. The technology behind this amazing piece of kit was designed by UCL Davis in California and they made it free for anyone who wanted to use it. Now this is just sand and there's a projector shining light down onto it which is showing off these, all, all these colours. But there's a very clever 3D camera that can read the landscape and watch what happens when I create a mound. The camera recognises that the shape of the sand has changed and what happens is it shows different colours according to the different heights. So in effect, it makes a topographic map out of the landscape. So we've got the different colours here. We've got the blue for the very low areas, green up to the yellow and orange, all the way up to white at the top. But even more amazingly, I can make it rain on this landscape, not with real water, but simulation of rain by holding my hand out and it shows how water would run off of the landscape that we've created. So we're going to be using this sandbox along the route to show you lots of different ways that water can be managed. So we're going to take a bird's eye view now of Somerset and we're going to imagine this is a very large landscape. So we've got the coast and we've got some sea over here. And what we've got in Somerset is this band of clay that sits a bit higher behind the coastline. And behind that, we've got the peat moors that sit a bit lower. If it wasn't for our coastal defences along here, then 18% of Somerset would actually be intertidal. That is to say, at high tide, twice a day, we would get an ingress of seawater. And historically, it was actually salt marsh. However, over the last couple of thousand years, we've put in an extensive network of reens and drainage channels that drain that whole area. So we're going to pop in a river. And that's going to drain the area of the peat moors out to sea. So now, the water that falls back here drains out through those channels out to sea. But as we've seen, this is very low lying. And so at high tide out here, that water wants to come back up that channel. However, in Somerset, every one of our river systems is tidally excluded to stop that from happening, with the exception of the Parrot. Now the Parrot is still open to the sea, and so has the high tide coming up through the channel. But on the other rivers, we have big gates, for example, called Clices. Now, as you can see, when the tide comes up, that water can't come up the channel. And these clices close at every high tide. However, what it also means is that during the time those gates are closed, the water can't drain out of the system either. And this is known as tide lock. So during the time when these are closed, then there's no drainage out through that channel. Now, the parrot is also tide locked but it's tide locked by the water that comes up through the system, which means that the level in the channel is too high for the drainage to go out to sea. This clice can't be reopened until the level of the sea has dropped to below the level of the water in the channel. And then the clice is opened and the channel can drain again. However, with sea level rise, we are going to see an increase in the amount of time that those clices have to be closed increasing the pressure of tide lock on the system. And we're also expecting to see a greater number of storm events, so there may be more water in the system as well. This is one of the reasons why Somerset is quite vulnerable to climate change. So you might have noticed that down on the Somerset levels and moors that lots of the river systems run through embanked channels. So I'm just going to create a landscape that represents that. So I'm going to create these high banks with the channel running through the middle there. Now these banks are very good at keeping the water in that channel and helping to reduce the flood risk to the surrounding land and property. Now what this means is that the water level in the channel can actually be higher than the level of the ground to each side. And that's why they're called high-level carriers. 
So we'll pop some water in the channel there. But what actually happens is that these banks have now separated that river from what would otherwise be its floodplain. Now the capacity of any river system within the channel is going to be far less than the capacity of the floodplain. So we need somewhere for the water to go when we've got a high rainfall event and the level in this river is very high. Now what we've got on these river systems are points called spillways. This is an engineered, specifically designed point which is where the bank is lower. And so when we get lots of rain, the water will run over the spillway and it will come into the surrounding moor. And that moor acts as storage capacity for this river system. Once the water has gone down in the channel, then we need to get the water off of that moor. But once that channel level has dropped, the water can't run back up the spillway. Now some moors are able to be drained through sluices or other gravity methods, which will allow the water to drain off of that moor. But with other moors, we actually have to pump that water off of that moor back into the channel. But only when the river level is low enough, because if this spillway is still running, all that will happen is the water will come straight back out again. As you can see, it's a very heavily managed landscape and it's very complex and organisations like the Internal Drainage Boards and the Environment Agency work really hard to monitor and manage the water in this area. Now, flood risk management is a complex business and we're going to use the sandbox now to demonstrate some of the reasons why it is complicated. So I'm going to create a landscape with a nice big hill in the middle here. Now, as you probably know, it rains more often on the top of a hill than it does at the bottom. You'll get heavier rainfall up on high ground. So that's where our rainfall is mainly going to be coming from. Now we've got two settlements. Here's Blue Town and here's Orange Town. And you might be able to see already that Orange Town sits slightly higher than Blue Town. And what that means is that when we get lots of rain on top of this hill, Blue Town has got a much higher flood risk than Orange Town at the moment. So let's do something to try to reduce the risk of flooding in Blue Town. So I'm going to build a great big bank up this side, and that is hopefully going to reduce their flood risk. Now that water is going to dry up in a second, and then we will have another rainfall event, but this time with this great big flood defence in place to protect Blue Town. And now we've got another rainfall event coming in on the hill. So this time you can see that that bank has done a fantastic job at helping reduce Blue Town's flood risk. But unfortunately, as you can see, we've increased the flood risk in Orange Town. Now when we're designing flood mitigation measures, we always have to bear in mind that the water has to go somewhere. So if we're stopping it from going in one place, it will go somewhere else and we have to be very careful that we are designing things in a clever way that doesn't increase anyone else's flood risk. That doesn't mean that we don't want to do everything we can to reduce the flood risk in Blue Town, but we have to do it in a smart way. And whenever a decision is made about flood risk management, all of these things have to be taken into consideration. Whether that's a small intervention or a very big intervention, the water has to go somewhere. Um, now what we've got here is we've made a very rough representation of Lascott Hill. You can see the village hall down the bottom, there's the cars in the car park, hedge and gate and we've got the woodland up at the top. Now in reality the woodland also extends out over the other half of this hill. Um, but we've taken that away just so you can see uh, the effect on the water and the way that it runs off when we remove some of those trees. Um, so I'm just going to make it rain and you'll be able to see the difference in the way the water runs off of this part of the hill where there's no trees and the part of the hill where there are trees. Now some of that water gets held back by the woods. And what happens in reality is that on that wooded part some of the water never hits the ground, it gets intercepted by the trees and then the water that does make it to the ground, there's a greater level of infiltration of the water getting soaked into the ground. So we get less surface water runoff from the wooded part of the hill than we would from the unwooded part. 
Um, and what actually happens in this area when we do get heavy rainfall, because of the lie of the land, you can see it all runs down to the gateway and then it can go out into the, the village hall car park and the road and cause some, some localised flooding there. So trees planted in the right place are one of the ways that we can reduce the effect of surface water runoff. So we're going to look at some of the ways that farmers are helping to protect our soils. Now imagine that this is an arable landscape. So arable means crops rather than pasture for livestock. Now what we've got here is a hill where we've got the green at the bottom going up to the white at the top. And along comes a farmer and in this case wants to plough the field. So over here if we were to plough the hill this way then we're going to see a difference in the way the water behaves than if we plough across the contours. Now you might remember from your geography lessons that this is called contour ploughing. So now when it rains on the hill we can see that the water runs down that landscape over there through those furrows much more readily than it does over here where we have the contour ploughing. Over there where the ploughing is up and down the hill we're getting a lot of runoff, a lot of erosion, we're losing soil, silting up the water courses at the bottom and there's nitrates and phosphates running off of the, the, the fields. Over here a lot of that problem is helped by that contour ploughing. So now we're going to look at another classic English landscape feature, hedgerows. So I'm just going to pop some hedgerows over here and we'll plant some hedgerows over here as well. Now all these hedgerows are going to help slow the flow of water, they're going to allow more water to infiltrate at their base and they're going to capture those nitrates, those phosphates and that eroded soil which would otherwise end up into, in your water courses. However, if you look at the way that the water runs down the hill when we make it rain again, then you can see the difference that the cross slope hedges make in the same way that the contour ploughing does. All of these hedgerows have really good value in terms of locking up carbon, biodiversity, but the cross slope hedgerows are a specific nature-based solution that we can use to help reduce flooding and drought. So now we're going to look at another landscape. Here we've got a hill with a river channel running off of that hill, down, round around this nice meander, and we've got a riverside community just over here. And what happens in a normal rainfall event is that that water that falls on that hill runs down the river channel around that meander. But when we get exceptional high rainfall, or if the ground's very saturated because it's been wet for some time, you can see that actually that water can't be contained within that river channel and then we've got flood risk within this community. So one of the ways that we can look at reducing that flood risk is by slowing the flow of water off of that hill, by capturing some of it and storing it up higher. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a series of ponds. Now these are special leaky ponds, so they will let the water out down the channel, but they'll let it out slowly and that will reduce the flood peak and consequently reduce the flood risk to this community here. And as you can see now when we've got a rainfall event, some of that water is stored up here in those ponds. So this type of slow the flow technique, it might take the form of leaky ponds like this or you might get leaky dams in the channel and also we've seen that trees on hills can also make a difference in slowing the flow of water. And this isn't about just one big measure that we're going to put in here. This is lots of small measures that together make a difference. And actually in Somerset, the Hills to Levels project has put in hundreds of these types of interventions funded by the Somerset Rivers Authority to help reduce flood risk. <laughs>